Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Game Junk Podcast, episode 103, recording on Sunday, May 1st, 2022. My name is Frank. My name is Sean. And my name is Andrew. And the world of games is a barren, dry landscape with only more desert in the future with game releases, scarce. There's nothing to feed on. No news. Sean, you look like you want to talk, like you're going to disagree with me. Well, I was just going to say, I was thinking about it. Is this because, like, normally E3 would be coming up? And I know, you know, E3 is not happening this year, but there are some. Like, they did just announce the Microsoft press event. Like, in terms of there was no nothing planned for? Yeah, just if people are holding back news for something bigger. Dude, E3's been dead for like two years. It's irrelevant. I think it's just everything got delayed from last year, released after people had new consoles and new money after Christmas. And I think they're realizing like good games sell for a long time until the next year, especially when consoles are at a shortage. So eventually when people get new consoles, they'll buy all the stuff that's already out. So uh, I, I don't think it's a planned thing. I think partly it was COVID and timing with things. But uh I mean, it's possible. It's always been the case, those cycles, but I just feel like stuff that used to be in maybe May got is earlier now. They just, it all came out in January and February and March. Well, yeah, I mean, summer's always been kind of a dead zone anyway, but mm -hmm. yeah. But who knows, but it is bone dry out there. So we are going to do a little bit of junk mail, even though it's it's a little scarce as well. But I think there's a little meat on that bone. So uh, anyone else need to say anything before we just get into it? No. Uh, no you man. look fucking pissed, dude. You got to chill the <laughs> fuck out. I think I might have to go on vacation and chill out. You were on vacation. That was your time for your drop. You asked me last week to put in your drop. I gave it to you, served it up on a plate. You couldn't hit. <laughs> you can remember what I'm talking about? I didn't I didn't get the drop. I didn't oh, add it to the board. Unbelievable, this guy. What an amateur podcaster. Pretty much. I did forget. You've done like ten thousand podcasts and you can't get a drop. Unbelievable. I just Come on, man. slipped my mind. <laughs> All right, let's he's got a lot on his mind these days. It's a busy guy. Junk mail. Uh this one comes from Falsk via the Discord. Colin and I spent last night helping a friend who was stuck in Breath of the Wild for the last four months. We proceeded to help him finish the very opening of the game, the plateau, the great <laughs> plateau. Sometimes I take for granted how tricky newer video games are for non-gamers. Have you ever had to help a non-gamer get through a game? Hmm. It's an interesting, it's interesting question. To me that it's Breath of the Wild, the greatest video game of all time that someone would struggle with in the opening area. But we'll get to that in the next question. I used well, to have to help when I was young, like friends of the family was like Frankie's into video games. Call Frankie if you're ever stuck in a game and I would help them. I have more people asking me for advice on what to buy. Uh, not as much for help actually beating things. Yeah, no one's asking me for help, but you have, uh, to, ask, you have to ask people for help, Sean. Like children, <laughs> no. But I mean, this does bring up an interesting point, which is you know, like you know, we like to say that I, I suck at games and all that kind of stuff. But there is a very, uh, it's all very relative, right? Like maybe compared to hardcore gamers, I am not, uh, you know, super invested and and super you know skilled but compared to the average person i mean i think i'm Can pretty much the average gamer that other than hardcore much gamers or soft i think you're just a core gamer you're a core gamer uh, or I compared just, to core gamers you're you're okay I, i'm right down the middle if you need somebody to play test a game to find out what the average gamer is going to think of it just call me invaluable a, that's pretty <laughs> true I, I would agree with that I've been, I've been helping my kids. Yeah, I keep I've been helping my kids. Sure. Yeah, lately, I mean, like we were playing a couple games today, and it's like the NH we were playing NHL yesterday, uh, and you know I put them on the NHL '94 controls, super simple, 
and they are struggling a bit, but they're starting to get it. They're starting to understand what a one-timer is and when to pass and not. So it, it takes a little bit to, especially with the 3D controls. I think that's probably the hardest thing for people to pick up, especially when you get into a game like Breath of the Wild, where you have to move and control the camera all at one time. I think that's probably where most of the help people will need. Uh, but we'll see. Yeah, I mean, you do take for granted that you know, there's a long progression of, you know, if you've been playing games for 20 years, 30 years, whatever it is, like, there's just a lot of things that you just, you just know. And if somebody's just jumping into gaming, they don't know these things. So it's, uh, it can be tricky. But yeah, yeah. The, my, my kids are helping me with games now. Like, <laughs> I'll talk about something uh, that I played this week, but it is literally getting to the point where I just say, I'm stuck. Do you guys want to try this? And like, sometimes like 50 percent of the time they get through it so <laughs> uh graham helped me with a game once i was stuck in i think the first lego star wars on xbox 360 there was like a weird volume for triggering something and uh he figured out how to uh like what the bug might be and got me through like one of those little uh doggy doors that yoda and certain characters could go through and aided in my getting a thousand achievement points in that game. Now I'm debating if I'm going to need help with something. I'm on the way to a platinum in Gran Turismo seven. I've been playing that a little bit here and there. Wow. I do like a little bit every day. And there's one trophy for getting gold in all licenses, which I don't think I'll ever be able to do in my life. And the question is, would I get someone to do them for me? Would I pay someone to do that for me? How low would I stoop to make that happen if I was one trophy away in Gran Turismo 7? And I definitely would ask someone to help me get it. 100%. <laughs> was this, this is what uh, the PS5 share play is for too, right? Exactly. It's a feature. Somebody take over. Yeah. So I have an interesting spin-off question or spin-off statement uh, related to this. Now, do you guys think that because games are so hard for new people, quote unquote new people, to get in, that there is sort of like this untapped market of, let's say, 30 to 50 year olds or 30 plus that will never get back into games because they just they can't pick it up now. It's too hard. Like uh, figuring out 3D is impossible for them. They're never going to try it. But will we see when all the kids these days come up gr playing these 3d games it's second nature to them will we see a huge bump in game sales as they all become consumers and start buying games for themselves because now you don't have just like a subsection of a population of people buying games but you have basically the entire population of people buying games yeah i mean my gut reaction is a small bump like as people get older, they tend to buy less games. And so that gets replaced with new people with income and maybe the market's always growing. So I assume there's some bump in general there. Uh, but I do find free to play games are cutting into that too. So, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if the curve is generally flat. Slowly increasing. A slow increase, flat. yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. They're all playing, all the, the younger generations are playing free-to-play games. They don't want to pay $80 for a game. So I don't know if that will happen, but... Uh, but I think that that's also a point towards Huck. If there's that many people playing free-to-play stuff now, when they do get money, which will be in the near future, and they realize those games are shit compared to games you pay for, that they'll start buying them. Don't yes. think that realization will happen. <laughs> They're well, playing well, I, the games they want to play. I, I'm not so sure. I think a huge part of it is cost and access. So, and I, I mean, this isn't factoring for like just sales. Doesn't include Fortnite bucks or whatever microtransaction system, as far as I know. V bucks. So, v bucks. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think I, it does. I assume that that's growing as well. So it's re diverting or changing revenue streams. But I feel like obviously in general, the market and market share and cash flow in games is growing constantly. Yeah. And I guess, I guess the other thing is like how many of those 
that market I talked about, 30 plus, doesn't play console games, but they play mobile games and spend a shit ton of money there. That's another question, which would be interesting to know, like the market breakdown of how who's spending money there. But I have a feeling, it, I, I've, I think I've heard that it's kind of like older women actually spend a lot of money in those sort of like Farmville games and stuff that used to be huge on Facebook. Now, I don't think that's the main market now. I think it's like whatever the games, Frank, you play. Um, but I don't know. It's, it'd be interesting to have those stats and see who's spending the money where. Anyways, total little side tangent there. Yeah, there, I, I thought you were going to go, will there be a, a market for easier games that are highly polished, which is something that mm. the Order 1886 would fit into. And I think it's more of just a market correction. Like, does someone have a good enough game that's short enough that they would make it a price point that no one could deny? It's amazing, even and if it is short. Similar to that, I mean, you have high-quality 2D games coming out, but I wonder if people... Like, how do people find these games now? You know, like, it's so... Like, the market just discovery is so difficult that unless something goes completely viral... Like, the people we're talking about would never see these games. Like, Kaze and the Wild Mass. No one has played that yeah, game. It's so, I mean, I know I've made this point before, but remember when Cuphead dropped and everyone lost it? Like, that was just because of art style. Nothing to do with mm -hmm. gameplay. And now, when we do an indie showcase, every game looks amazing. So how do you even stand out? Like, the only way to stand out is via, like attachment rate via early access or streamers or something it's it's really tough to get noticed yeah and i think that untapped demographic you're talking about like a lot of them still buy consoles because they just that's the thing like they have money and they're like i want to get the new cool thing but then they probably buy one or two games and then don't play them so how call do of you duty. <laughs> yeah so how call do of duty you, and madden how do you like come up with like a a blockbuster game that looks amazing that they're going to feel like they're getting their money's worth uh but it's not like super hard like some something in that zone or you don't and everything's subscription model which could be another way we go and then just yeah. pick and choose what you want and then that i mean that's a really the difference right if the order 1886 just came out as part of a subscription service like i don't think it would have been denied the, the reviews would have been completely different if, if it was just rev like the only way you could get it was with a monthly subscription. It's like, wow, that's pretty good for my $15 mm -hmm. monthly subscription or whatever. For sure. That's an amazing game. Okay. Uh, so in summary, none of us get helped. No one helps anyone. <laughs> <laughs> now the true shame in this question is for Nintendo. A player was stuck on the Great Plateau for four months in the greatest game ever created in the history of games. Which leads to the next question, indirectly, from Blakey. Uh, Dear game men, I was thinking about game mechanics tropes that could go bye-bye. The first thing to come to mind are boss fights. Boss fights make sense in old game design, arbitrarily increasing difficulty in an attempt to justify the end of specific game chapters and or finales. It's almost a relic of the, of coin sucking arcade games, throwing in a bullet, throwing in bullet punch sponges just to pad out the game. Boss fights suck. I'd rather a developer allow for more organic challenge increase or story elements that signify a sense of completion. This is probably why I hate Dark Souls games. Fuck boss fights. That being said, what are your top five boss fights? Love always, Blakey. So I don't think we're doing our top five boss fights. We've kind of touched on them here or there, but we can start with talking about whether boss fights are antiquated. I strongly disagree. And then we'll also talk about game mechanics that we're ready to say bye-bye to. And I've got quite a few. So uh, let's... First of all, I'll, I'll start with boss fight stuff. I love boss fights, and it has nothing to do with the origins of boss fights. Assuming this is true, that it's about big jumps in difficulty. Uh, that's not what I see boss fights as. They are spectacle moments. Uh, they, for me, a great boss fight involves scale, uh, an element of puzzle solving. They are rewards and checkpoints simultaneously. But when I think of 
great boss fights. It has nothing to do with how hard it was. Some people evaluate boss fights like, ooh, that was hard. That's a good boss fight. That has nothing to do with it for me. It's all about the ideas, the art, the scale. They're moments. There are moments in games that are great. It has, it has nothing to do with challenge for me. And maybe that's why we differ. Yeah, I think I, I still really like them. Like, And uh, talked about this a little bit last year with um, Axiom Verge 2, right? That was one of their things is that all the boss fights are optional. You you come across a, a giant boss, you can just walk right past them. You don't have to beat them. You get a small reward if you do. Um, and I did find that, you know, that kind of made the game a little less satisfying as a result. Like, there there is something about boss fights being something that you're building towards. You know, you're, you're, you, as a player, you're like, okay, that's the next sort of objective on the horizon for me. And usually it's bringing together some new mechanics you've just learned and now you put them all to use against, you know, that, that sort of final checkpoint of that chapter. I don't know, that structure just works for me. I, I, st I still like it. And in terms of thinking about what works and doesn't work in boss fights, I didn't think this through that much today, but if I had one general direction for boss fights, recommendation, it would be stationary bosses bosses should be stationary the bosses i hate the most are ones where i'm running away from them as much as i'm figuring out what to do whether it's like a, a half cut off level and a boss at the other end or you know something like that i think the best boss fights tend to stay in place or have limited camera and movement aspects to them not saying there aren't exceptions to that rule but if i was stuck like uh, i want to design a boss first of all the idea of moving around of bo a boss isn't that interesting. You can take a stationary boss, and they all do this. They have attacks or telegraphs or whatever that still make you move and dodge. It just keeps your focus on the boss and not from like running around and having to worry about the camera at the same time. So I, I generally favor stationary bosses. And I was thinking, is that just a two D, a three D thing? But no, two D. I think like Kraid and other stationary two D bosses are potentially more satisfying than the ones that like just move across and you're jumping over them. That becomes the whole boss jumping over them. Unless you do interesting things with how you like Mega Man's pretty good at having like jumps and leaps that you're avoiding and it's timing pattern recognition. But if it's just an enemy dashing across the screen, I'm getting pretty sick of that stuff too. So uh, I don't know. Those are my thoughts on boss fights. And lastly, puzzles. Puzzle elements to boss. Zelda's great at this. Like figuring out what you have to do to beat a boss in terms of elements, something you just learned, uh, using them in creative ways, and uh, like exploring the boss. I, I like when boss fights do that too. And scale elements, the ones that come to mind are like Ares in the first God of War, uh, or even God of War 3, I think when you fight Zeus and it becomes like a, a fighting game. So switching up mechanics and doing something interesting for a boss, which Metal Gear is also known for and has some of the best boss fights ever. Well, with the exception of the if the final boss is suddenly, you're completely changing the mechanics. I remember God, the first God of War, there was something with that where the final boss fight was very different. And I remember, I don't remember exactly what that it was Ares, now. That like where you're huge and you fight... That's what I'm talking mm, about. Is it? I don't very hard. It's a very hard boss. Maybe it was. But yeah, I just remember it being something where it's like whatever you had done up to that point, it's all out the window and it's something brand new. Indivisible was like that big time. All of a sudden you had to use the guard mechanic that and be perfect with it to beat the boss. And if I didn't use it the entire game, and now I had to get amazing at it. I I totally agree with you guys. Uh I love boss fights. I think they're spectacle they should have puzzles basically everything frank and sean have been saying i agree with i don't really have anything to add so i won't really keep going but i think what blake's saying is interesting in the sense that like i think there are good boss fights where you're not maybe fighting like a like a one boss like it could be like you know you're in a room with like a bunch of like traps and things happening like that could still be considered a boss fight and could still be fun uh, I just think there's a lot of different variations on that. I guess to me, it comes down to pacing and variety where like that's, it's more about moments and boss fights are a great way of making things a moment. There are other ways to do it too. Uh, but you know, for Embers of Miram, I was always thinking about like just variety. A chase sequence to me is the equivalent of a boss if it's interesting or 
just you know changing the uh, the pressure of a situation. And boss fights are a good way of doing that. And leave it leaves a lasting impression on the player. They're a little more difficult, so you can put a little more effort into the the level, the art, the mechanics, because you know the player's going to spend a significant amount of time there. Uh, so it, yeah, that's to me, it's not about challenge; it's about interest level and spectacle. Okay, so this other part of this question, which to me is the most interesting, is game mechanics and tropes that could go bye bye. <laughs> And uh, Huck, did you want to go first? Maybe share one of these that you had? Sure. So the first one is kind of like the breakable weapons that are in Breath of the Wild. I do not like this mechanic, at least in the form that is in Breath of the Wild. I feel like it's way too punishing. I'm spending most of my time just trying to hoard weapons so that I can keep them for later. Um, like hoard my good weapons so I can keep them for later and then just happen to have some shitty weapons I can use to get by. Um, when, like, the Master Sword that you have to work so hard at getting can still be damaged? Like, what the hell? Um, super frustrating. And I don't like it. I, it's not fun. Well, I, I generally agree, but I think there... You could imp just improve upon it by having economies that influence... Sure. Like, you, know, you can have a weapon last forever, but it's going to cost you something else that you've been saving. Or I'm totally fine with that. It's more the duration. Like having it so short, it seems like weapons last very little amount of time, and that's not fun to me. I want to be able to play for more than five minutes before my weapon breaks. Well, also, like, how, would you consider what about um, you know guns that run out of ammo quickly, and then you're forced to switch to another weapon? Like, is that? Kind depends of on the gun. Or... Depends on the power of the gun. Yeah, yeah. like you're talking like in Halo kind of thing, or yeah, I, I, like I I agree. Breath of the Wild, like that was probably my least favorite thing in the game was the breakable weapons. Um, but you know, I'm trying to think of other games that maybe there's something similar, maybe not quite as harsh, but yeah, I mean, in in a game like Halo or games where you run out of bullets, usually they work because you're killing guys that have tons of weapons, and there's also lots of guys. So you're you're constantly able to get a new weapon. Whereas in Breath of the Wild, like you clear out a small little like goblin hole or whatever, and then you gotta travel like quite a ways to get to find something else. And maybe you stumble across something that doesn't even have something good because it's all open. So you could go to like a lower level area and find lower level guys, and then you gotta travel another spot. Whereas Halo, it's like a corridor, so they're basically sending guys at you with weapons that you would want to use anyway, so you're always have stuff available. Um, what, was, what was the other thing you talked about there with, uh, like, I guess um, even just, like, being able to repair your weapons, like in, I think, Skyrim and Oblivion, games like that, they have weapons that have durability, most RPGs do, but you can always go to a forge and repair that stuff if you really want to, but usually in those games you can also, you know, go to a shop and easily buy new weapons that are better, and it doesn't feel like, um, you know, if I run out, or they give you repair kits that you can use in the fields, or you can buy repair kits that you know you'll be able to use later. Whereas in Breath of the Wild, I feel like you're basically just like, that's it, you're done. You have to go find something else. So I think, I think like, like Frank was saying, there's just not enough economy around the Breath of the Wild ones, and you just need more uh, ways to keep the stuff you like, even if you have to use yeah. up your money or your rupees or whatever. I think the, the trade-off there, or maybe the game design uh, argument for it would be that pushing you to try out different weapons and being able to experience all the you know all that stuff. But I think Breath of the Wild well, versus Halo I mean, are kind of different games, right? Like you generally pick a weapon you like and stick with it. In Zelda games, Halo, you're always switching. Well, Breath of the Wild features systemic game design. It's a bunch of different systems, weather, uh, night and day, all these things that interact to create unique experiences. So having the weapons get destroyed forces you to see the combinations of those different systems and use different things, which I understand the motivations. I just don't think it's that much fun. Well, you could also change it on its head and create different enemy designs that make you know certain weapons useless against. Um, like maybe you know maybe you have an electric sword you really like. Will you come up against enemies that are immune to electricity and therefore you have to switch? 
uh, like take it take a different approach. And it's really I, and this is why the game's kind of broken to me. Uh, well, not broken. That's a bit of a exaggeration. But then you get across an enemy that needs a certain weapon type, and you're you're kind of screwed. screwed. You're, you're running around and you can't do anything. And I remember one boss fight and one of the divine beasts being like that. It was like an, a charged electricity boss fight. Uh, and it was just brutal. It was one of the worst boss fights I've ever done in my life. It was so frustrating. Do you remember this one? They, they like, they have electricity charges and all this stuff and they put these spikes in the ground. Oh God, it sucked so bad. So oh, remember. bad. Uh, okay, well, might as well just stay on Breath of the Wild then if we're doing mechanics that go bye-bye. <laughs> Cooking. <laughs> Cooking gotta go. Uh, even the brief amount I played uh, Horizon Forbidden West, the there was a potion-making thing where you would go to a cook and make these potions and do all this stuff. It's I guess it's not cooking so much, but how you cook and having to go to someone or in Zelda, go to a menu, pick five ingredients... And then put it in something, wait five seconds to get a potion that lasts for two minutes? What? What are we doing here? This It took me more time to cook it than the potion's useful for. That's the first sign an economy's broken. Then, not even, main, at least games that give you like a shortcut to those recipes, I, exploring and discovering recipes can be fun, but to have to remember them all in your head, brutal. Uh, no totally thank agree. you. Yeah. You, can use, you can use paper to write stuff down too. That's oh yeah, that's a lot of fun. That's why I play video <laughs> games to get a, my phone out and make notes about all the recipes. So what everyone does, they just go to some internet thing or like it's weak. It's bad game design, and I think the the economy point is the most relevant. It can take more time to make something than it's useful for. That is stupid. Uh, not good. I'm I, I I'm not gonna say stealth, even though I'm thinking it. Sorry, Sean, did you want to add to cooking? Well, I was just, I was going to take cooking a step further and say, I'm not that crazy about crafting in general in games. I don't like, either, really. You know, it, it depends. I'm okay with it as long as it's quick. The last yeah, of uh, crafting is amazing because you're not, you're not a burdened with stuff to craft with. It's like a survival element. Sean might be referring to like crafting as cooking where you like put in random things and see what happens like that kind yeah of stuff, or right? or like i don't know I even i guess kind of what frank's talking about like having to craft ammo like when you run out of ammo like uh, it depends like obviously if a survival game survival horror makes a little more sense uh, i remember like with horizon the new horizon that that's an element of it that i wasn't crazy about but i like it in horizon because you just do it in the in the wheel you don't have to go to someone to ask them to craft something for you or stop your gameplay. The game's paused, and it's so fast to craft things. Like it's 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 the not. menu is pretty pretty convenient, so that's true. I, and, yeah, oh, I never. Game. Sorry, I was just just on the crafting. I I just I also I never really liked the idea, similar to the Breath of the Wild thing, where they give you like a shit ton of raw materials, and it's up to you to like play around and figure it out. I hate that because. I'm always worrying I'm gonna make a mistake, use the wrong You're thing. Waste it, right? Yeah. I don't know I don't know like how prevalent these raw materials are. And so I'm like constantly just hoarding everything and never trying anything. It's like the antithesis of what the crafting system is designed <laughs> it's, to be. It's choice paralysis, which is it, it really is, yeah. Which is not what game design is supposed to do. It's supposed to yeah. be the opposite. Uh sorry, that reminded me. Ratchet and Clank is a good way of encouraging weapon experimentation. Ammo is a limited resource, and you can choose to use money to improve them, or leveling up the weapons is a, like by using them is like, okay, I, if I want to improve all this stuff, there are ways to encourage experimentation without being in, like insanely frustrating, like Breath of the Wild. So once again, Ratchet and Clank, you've done it again. You've solved weapon wheels, which Breath of the Wild is incapable of, and you've solved weapon experimentation. Uh, well, I was going to say I would like to get rid of stealth, but I don't think it's completely valueless, and I do like it in some scenarios. But there is one mechanic tied to stealth that might be my number one bye-bye mechanic, and that is tagging enemies like having binoculars and looking from afar and tagging enemies. It is so monotonous. It is the antithesis of fun. Uh, looking at things and hitting a button, like it, it's so, 
if it's a like a a mechanic where you can do it quickly and kind of a carpet tag that's a, an economy or something like that that i can deal with but having to like look one by one and tag an enemy by pressing up on the d-pad ugh, barf <laughs> who is this for yeah i mean if it's just so that if that's what you have to do just so you know where they are and you can kind of be aware of where everyone's patrolling and stuff i don't really like that if it's like if there's something more to it like tagging them increases damage or some something more a little strategic then maybe it's it's better yeah the only game that kind of improved upon it was uh death loop for me because there was power-ups on weapons where if you hit someone with a bullet it would tag anyone in the vicinity like okay, okay that's making it a little more fun and it's nice to see those things but in general like y- you kind of want to tag everyone in an area so it's not really useful to tag one enemy in an area when there could be five you missed so i have mm. to keep looking it's only good if you tag every enemy otherwise the one you missed like so it's it encourages you to stay still and look at things and i guess plan i guess people who plan uh when they're gaming enjoy that type of thing i am not one of those people uh, and even in phantom pain i remember just being like oh i I, I, there's 40 enemies. I'm going to tag every one. What is the point of this? We got, we got satellites, don't we? Just like, let me uh, tag them for me. Yeah. I like the result of the tagging, like being able to know where everyone oh. is, especially in a game like Phantom Pain, where the point is to avoid people. And, uh, but like, does it, it doesn't even really make sense in that. Like, should he really still know that that guy is behind exactly. the building? Like, no, he shouldn't know that. Like, you can see the triangle, but you shouldn't be able to actually know he's there. Like, maybe he changes direction. Like, how would you know that? You wouldn't know that. Uh, but and, and sorry, you see the whole evolution of this mechanic through the series of Metal Gear Solid. The first one's the best one, or two. Vision cones. Vision vision cones make no sense, but they're fun and they're a visible and readable gameplay mechanic. Metal Gear Solid Three tried to introduce like. Literally, you had to be looking to see where other people are looking at you with the camouflage element, and that was decidedly unfun, I would say, until they started to improve the camera in the remasters and H- in HD remakes. And then four was the active camo, which is basically acknowledging camouflage isn't fun. It'd be better if you just automatically camouflage. And then the fifth one, is like that's probably why I didn't finish it. I feel like it devolved into... like. The monotony of stealth of real life stealth and that's not why i play games yeah i feel like the i don't even know if i would say it's the best but i feel like a appropriate use of this mechanic is maybe in like the assassin's creed games with the eagle where you have to kind of pre-scout the area and determine the points of interest that you need to go to by scouting it, and then you can kind of plan a little bit of your path in. I think that makes the most sense for this sort of tagging mechanic, but all the other situations where you're just kind of like going around a corner and then doing a special button press, like you're saying, to tag all the people you can now see, that's not really that fun. Yeah, I agree. The eagle thing is kind of what I was alluding to with the, the carpet tagging like a whole bunch at once and it's some kind of system it doesn't quite do that in assassin's creed though you still have to kind of like focus in from like but that stinks uh but the i i feel like there could be a good version of tagging where if you knew there wasn't that many enemies right like some super uh like hardcore for back of a lack of a better word where you know that you know there's very few enemies but if one sees you that is like really crucial and like could be a huge penalty or something like that where you want to be careful but most of these games that i've tagging there's literally 30 enemies like it's not exhaustive and it really doesn't really serve your time to tag enemies all right we done with tagging? Because I got another one that I'm ready. I, I got I got two more I could add. Okay, you go but ahead. Dwight, have Sean you added loves, any? Sean loves everything. Uh, the only thing I got... Well, I mean, I, I kind of mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but just roguelike, souls-like stuff in general. Like, I'm just getting sick of that in every game, but it's not really a mechanic, so... Uh, so I'll go... 
One, I think this has kind of already been going bye-bye, but I haven't played any Call of Duty games lately, but I hate infinite spawning enemies, especially in like a mind. small confined area. You know, I there's no magic trigger that's going to that's supposed to stop people from coming. Like if I clear out a room, okay, send one more wave of like reinforcement guys, then that's it. Let me just slowly move on without having to worry that some guy's going to creep up on me from the monster closet he's spawning from. I hate that shit. I I love to just hunker down, take out all the guys and then progress forward. But when I start killing everyone and then they just keep coming through the doors, that drives me crazy. I don't know when I am supposed to progress and I hate that and there shouldn't be 10,000 guys in one building. Which is why the emergence hole mechanic of Gears of War. Yes, is amazing. The best. I agree. One of the most underrated mechanics of all and time. Even, and even that they don't just keep <laughs> coming forever. I don't think. I think they do run out after some amount. It's just you yeah. pick and choose. Do you want it's to limit the amount of guys? a choice for the player or a skill. Can you, yeah. can you close this hole? Exactly. Using resources and skill. Next one for me. Oh, this might be number one of all time. Over encumbrance systems. <laughs> Especially games where there's stuff everywhere and having to decide what to pick up and not. And then going to your inventory, dismantling, destroying... That whole process is the worst. I, I'm okay with like having to dismantle and sell stuff, but if you put on top of that, that you, they start to weigh things and you slow down, nothing kills my buzz playing Fallout or some other piece of shit Bethesda game. <laughs> when all of a sudden I pick one thing up and I start moving super slowly, I'm like, oh, great. And now I can go to menus and decide what to drop for 20 minutes. Like, what the fuck? Like, I, you know what? Have shortcuts for selling things or dismantling things. I can live with that. And then it's up to the player to decide what they want to do. But ugh, it's the worst. No one likes it. Good call. No one likes it. Get rid of it. Good call on that one. I totally forgot. Cyberpunk. <laughs> looking at you. Elden Ring, more like. What? Yeah. Elden Ring's not that bad for that. Yeah, because you get the... Yeah, but you can't get slow, over and you have the slow roll or whatever. Like, but that's I, not for carrying inventory. That's for deciding what kind of armor you want to wear. It doesn't. I guess that's true. I thought the I thought the items affected it as well, but I don't. I mean, that. that's to me. It's it really does come down to like I don't mind having a limit, but it's like if that affects your mobility, not cool. The last one I have. Oh, the last one I have, which is more of like an ask rather than a bye-bye but i want to say that any game with like a story and an open world where there's different options you can go to and and it may not be clear where your next objective is let's get rid of the no journal system or no summary of what has happened in the past we're not all game journalists we don't all play you know straight through a game in in a week sometimes we leave games for multiple days at a time only to return and have no idea what the fuck we are doing we need some sort of like summary i mean this is harder for developers to put in but i would love if games that are open and i mean to a certain extent i feel like map markers help with this if you don't have a journal of some kind but there's got to be some way to like mark your progress or mark what you are doing when you save out and so that when you come back you have an idea of where to go. So, so you're saying the mechanic that should go by is go by by is to not the have lack of a journal. mechanic. Yes. <laughs> okay. The lack of a mechanic needs to go by gotcha. by. We need we need a mechanic. Fair it's enough. It's the anti the anti by by. I feel like I had another one. I probably forgot it already because I'm blowing so mechanics, Frank. It's only in one game, and they knew it sucked. <laughs> so. Blowing sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it, though. Although I just should play some Nintendo games for a while, and I'm sure <laughs> a list of another ten. You know, this is a, a honorable mention, but blue shells really need to go. I know blue it's blue like shells. A, a cliche, yeah. And Mario Kart, like last place targets the first place. Purple shells? Aren't they purple? They're blue. Uh oh. I think they're blue. Uh -oh. 
Feel free to go to the internet. Uh oh, who's colorblind out of us? You two or myself? Good question. <laughs> Let's find out. I'm looking it up. Is there I a think purple, purple shell? I, f- I don't know if there's a separate purple shell. But oh, this, one, this one, this one definitely looks blue. blue. <laughs> this one definitely looks blue. <laughs> All right. The spiny shell. We'll just call it the spiny shell or blue shell. It says here. Okay. I'm I'm crazy. I'm really glad I brought that honorable mention. <laughs> <laughs> it will come up in the future. All right. Last question. Uh, and I, I don't. This is their am like am Josh UAF or am think, Joshua F. I, yeah, I'm not sure who. Yeah, am, yeah. I guess it's am Joshua F. Uh, yeah, this might be a, a wet noodle, but favorite pre-internet video game magazines. Not sure if it's been asked or how much conversation it can generate, but what are you going to do? I, I know my favorite video game magazine of all time, and I've probably said it on this podcast before. Die Hard Game Fan. It was... Die Hard Game Fan. Oh, Never yeah. Heard of it. <laughs> Somehow this seems like the it was hard, Frank it was magazine. hard to find <laughs> the episode. Uh, the they go for a lot of cash. Some of the the issues on eBay, and they like had great pictures, great reviews. Uh, I loved Die Hard Game Fan. Hmm. Well, I I was definitely a big Nintendo Power guy. I had a subscription. Still have a stack somewhere in my crawl space. Uh, I also have a box of all my old video game magazines that maybe would be an interesting live stream to kind of... Yeah, that could be fun. Go through them. Um, definitely EGM. I, I did... I would never subscribed, but I did buy a bunch of those. Game EGM, Pro, was, EGM was really solid. Like, the review layout, four perspectives. Uh, Die Hard Game Fan was very similar. They kind of copied... EGM's format, but EGM would be my number two easily. Yeah, uh, Game Pro. I, I read a little bit here and there, but I was never that like. I was more into the TV show, you know. Game Pro was show. like your the first time you got into video games, and you saw it there, and you they saw the awesome, cool uh, rating system. It's like total noob ga- game magazine. It's like, <laughs> oh, this is so cool, and then you realize it's a piece of shit. <laughs> and it's, it's all ads, and it's worthless. Pretty Game much sucks. Uh, but then the one magazine that I kind of like once I was a bit older that I actually read that I don't know if it's still around or what, but it actually was quite good was uh, Edge magazine. Did you guys ever read this? It was like I think a UK based magazine. I, I had a few issues of Edge. Yeah, I just thought it was you know really put together well. Had some you know really solid writers, and uh, I always I always kept an eye out for it if I was ever at a magazine rack somewhere. I mean, I was starved for content. I would buy any video game magazine, really. Game Players was another one I would uh, buy quite often in the the peak era of games. Nintendo Power is the only one. I don't think I ever had an issue of Nintendo Power. Because hmm. it was only subscription-based. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, I, is that the, true? The, I the, thought it was in stores at some point, but... I don't Nintendo think so. Nintendo Power is the only one I had a subscription to, actually. I think that's the only game magazine I ever personally bought. I was never into game magazines that much. I was just like a, a whatever you call it, not a real gamer type guy growing up. <laughs> what we call uh, it. <laughs> but I recall watch it, walking through a couple of shoppers pre-Optimum card days and seeing, you know, a couple EGMs. And I think Computer Gaming World is ringing a bell. As one that you used to see, yeah, kind of in there. Uh, so I don't, I don't think I ever picked up any of those, but those were the ones I would always see. And and then I had, I had like maybe fifty Nintendo, or I guess I probably had fifty-two Nintendo Power magazines. You know, I probably got a one-year subscription, <laughs> and uh, that was it. Well, was it mon- Nintendo it was Power? Monthly, so yeah, monthly or monthly? Okay, I probably had like twenty-four then or something. Not very many. I thought I might even buy monthly or bi-weekly at some point. Do you guys remember there was that other Nintendo one that I feel like it was free, but it came like a couple times a year and it was only like a few pages. It was like Nintendo Power Flash or something like that. Does this sound familiar to you? Sounds guys? like when they had a new game they wanted to advertise, they would send that out. Maybe. 
Nintendo, yeah, Nintendo Power Flash is what it was called. Definitely I like how Nintendo Power, like Nintendo Power, was like owned by Nintendo, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, I think so. Pretty sure, right? right? I like <laughs> just Nintendo marketing Power material. Just turned into IGN and all game journals <laughs> and, and, and everything. Um, but that reminded me, I had a dream about video game magazines last night. Oh yeah, just it happens wow. once in a while when I'm in a when I'm in a store and I'm like looking for the newest game magazine and I'm like, Oh, I got to look for the game magazines. I go back to like being a teenager. <laughs> it happens pretty often. Actually. I love I, I almost I love in- the internet to be destroyed so I can buy game magazines again. Yeah. I was never like a game magazine guy. I was more like comic books. So I would do that with comic book stuff. Not really with, uh, with game magazines. Ever. There was nothing better than the CES edition of EGM. Oh my, it would, it would be like so thick. It would be like a Bible and I'd just be so ecstatic walking home from the <laughs> corner store with that thing. Oh, when you got that thick spine, that was the greatest feeling. Yeah. Definitely. I feel like if I think of what changed a pivotal moment for me in video games was going to the United States and buying the Electronic Gaming Monthly with Sonic 2 on the cover. That was a, a life-changing moment. The, 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 the white background with the number two, it was nicely designed. It was a game I couldn't wait for. That was a definitive moment in my life when it comes to video games. That's when you knew Sonic needed to be in my top loser, 30 games of all time. Love, left. That's, <laughs> I'll tell you what, it was a factor for why it was in the top 10. <laughs> Thinking about how important that game was to me, 100%. Okay, are we done? Yeah, I think I think that's it. Let's talk about. Well, there's one more kind of, but we'll save it for another time. Blake's had enough questions through here already. <laughs> but if you want to get your questions in Discord, get on the Discord in the YouTube uh, description. Game Junk Podcast at gmail dot com forward slash Game Junk or Game Junk Podcast at gmail dot com. Thank you, Sean. You're welcome. Okay, what do we play here? I could I I got Deathloop out of the old library, put in an hour or so. It's um interesting, I'll say. Uh, I'm the, I guess the like dialogue back and forth. I heard that was like a problem for some people. I don't really have that much of a problem with how they're kind of like uh, portraying the story and feeding it out to you. I think it's pretty good. It definitely feels like an arcane game you know like a uh a game what was the uh, dishonored uh like a, a heritage game of dishonored all the enemies in dishonored games kind of feel the same uh you know basic patrol routes the same sort of like animation style and i i i have been liking how they've been serving up with the looping and the tutorial. I thought their tutorial was actually pretty good with like introducing you to the weapons. And I, I felt like they introduced the different mecha- different mechanics, like different things you could find at a good pace and how they introduce you to, you know, the looping factor was good, but I, I haven't really got it yet. Like I know Frank, you're saying it takes a, takes a while. while. That's the biggest problem. I that. haven't really yeah. gotten like, the equipment screen is like really overwhelming to me so far. I can't really tell like what to equip or there's just like so many screens of stuff to equip and put in different spots and blah, blah, blah. I'm just like, I don't know what any of this shit is going to do on. For now, so, my advice would be just follow the mission. The game is telling you to go on. Just track. That's basically all I've been doing. And I've been basically just like running as quickly. Like I haven't been trying to kill anybody. I don't know the reason for killing guys right yet. Uh, I don't think you gain anything really by killing people other than an easier backtracking time, I guess, if you need to backtrack. But I basically just like sprinting through areas trying to get through to the, you know, mission spot you need to get to. And it seems to be going fine. I mean, I'm not really getting much out of it, but I mean, that's all I'm doing. My motivation is killing things is fun and and aiming things. So unless you're aiming to tag things, then it's the worst. (laughs) (laughs) I have been doing some of that. I'm already aiming at them. Let me shoot them, not tag them. Sean, <laughs> what are you playing? Uh, well, I'll start by saying, so the game I've been putting the most time into, uh, Superland, which 
I, it's on Game Pass. I had played this like I tried it a while ago too. Yeah, I, like when it first hit Game Pass, I played it a little bit and I liked it and kind of filed it away as okay, this is something I should get back to. But it just took me a long time to get back to it. Uh, but I'm really enjoying it, and it is. You know, they describe it as like uh, Metroid meets Portal, basically, and that's kind of accurate, I think. Like, it's first-person game. I would say it's much more on the puzzle side than on the combat action side. There is some combat, but it's it's not the best. It's a little clunky, and and it's not that often that it happens. Um, but you know, it's um, just yeah, a lot of interesting kind of um weapons and power-ups that i haven't really seen in like a metroidvania type game before and uh just a, you know kind of an open world where you're moving around and there's always puzzles to solve as you go uh my biggest complaint is that it really needs a map <laughs> i mean i think it's i think it was made mainly by yeah, who said guy. maps weren't fun why is every game getting rid of maps yeah it's it has no one been, was asking for maps to go bye bye we want them back, baby. <laughs> it does feel like a little bit of a trend, maybe. No maps. Um, but this one, I mean, like I said, it's single developer. And, and he has said that specifically he wanted people to have to explore and find things. And you know what? Fine. But I think it could have at least used sort of like a, um, like a high-level map of just like different sections. Because there's a couple times in the game where I was in an area I had basically done everything I needed to do in that area and I knew I had to leave the area but I couldn't figure out how to leave the area and that was kind of frustrating um, and they kind of like the way they do fast travel is there's like these launchers that will kind of launch you in the air over walls to different sections um, but anyway I'm, I'm pretty close to the end it's actually a pretty long game like I'm almost 30 hours with this thing which is a little surprising but i have been playing with the kids they kind of got into it too and so you know some of that is probably just them screwing around and not really doing much in the game but um but yeah i, I there's a sequel that just came out too only on steam right now uh so i might check that out at some point as well but um i yeah i i think it's worth checking out I, i'm enjoying it well we're talking about you and the kids what about uh bug snacks dlc was that a thing it was a thing i mean they were both super excited about it and they played it you know the day it came out and then they haven't gone back to it yet so i don't know what that means but uh i i watched them play a little bit and the one thing that struck me as weird uh, is it's you know isle of big snacks so the thing is they're giant bug snacks in this new island that you go to like and the first like thing they give you baby scale yeah but the first thing they give you is like this uh what was it i don't know some kind of potion or something that shrinks them so you can catch them and i'm like that seems weird like i was envisioning like oh how are you going to catch these giant bug snacks and it's like we'll just shrink them to regular size and then catch mm -hmm. them <laughs> you gotta shrink them or grow you i don't know which one's gonna be i Shrinking guess makes sense I haven't played much. Uh, like I said, I've been playing a bit at Gran Turismo 7. Yesterday, I fired Nobody Saves the World up again on PS4, started over. And there is something about drink box games. Once I start, I can just keep playing them. I, I, I have to force myself to stop. There is just this playability factor that I... That game, I like even more the more I play it. So need to platinum that and maybe platinum it again on PS5. I'm playing the PS4 version just in case oh, they patch God. it with a, with a <laughs> transfer. But uh, I'm really liking it. And the only other new thing I played for about an hour, I've been trying to play PC games. It's been a bit of a struggle. But I tried uh, the first Warhammer Vermintide because people had told oh, me it's wow. kind of a Left 4 Dead game. I thought I'd give it a shot, and it was on sale. And it is. It's actually pretty close to Left 4 Dead. I don't know if it's quite as good. I picked a, a melee class, uh, the, the dwarf, I think, or I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not like a, a Warhammer person, but you're kind of using an axe and a shield, and it was pretty good. I, I, I would be curious to try it co-op. Uh, it, it, it is very similar to Left 4 Dead, 
And I know there's a sequel already. Uh, I'm not sure how much they've improved with that. But I did get that general confusion and overwhelming feeling that I get with a lot of PC games. Very uh, detailed and like intense menus and figuring out what's going on. But in general, I thought it was pretty good. It's, it's a nice PC game. And I was playing with keyboard and mouse and uh, trying to get better at that. <laughs> well, speaking of confusing and overwhelming, I find the Warhammer IP a little confusing and overwhelming. There's just so many Warhammer games. I don't know what they all are, but they're like different genres and stuff. And it's just, I find it confusing. Yeah, people mm-hmm. love Warhammer and I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> Me I know too. the new uh, RTS game, I think, is really popular. Were you playing that hawk or was it something else? Is that the Warhammer 3 Total War or something, something like yeah. that? Yeah, I tried. I think I told you it crashed. So I haven't gone back to it yet. Is it on yeah. Game Pass? Yeah, PC. Oh, maybe I'll give it a shot. It's like 110 gigs, though. I, I'm like, what is in this game? <laughs> hmm. Yeah, it's huge. <clears throat> um, Anyone else have anything? I, got, I, I jumped back into Destiny 2 which I had never really gotten very far past the original kind of like tutorial. So I did it again and it's Bungie just knows how to make a shooter. I don't know how they're so good at it, but it just feels so great to run around and shoot stuff in their The worlds they create. So uh, I'm enjoying it. I, I like it. I think they, uh, I was talking to one of my buddies that is deep, deep into destiny two. And he said that a lot of new players are complaining because they don't know where to go. I haven't had a problem with it so far. I mean, you're, there's kind of like one central guy you talk to for your quests and he gives you them. There's a little bit of confusing stuff around these like almost like little bonus side quests you have to pay for, which I don't totally understand. It's kind of like, you know, kill 10 guys or use your super move three times on your, like when you're out fighting your next thing. That's a little weird, uh, but I think that's all it is. I think it's just like a way to spend your money to get kind of like bonus experience. So it's kind of like a risk reward type thing, or I don't think they go away. So I think it's just kind of like you, you buy these like packs that you can achieve or not achieve whenever you want. Uh, but I, I, I really like the game so far and I'll probably, probably keep playing it. I say that for every game that I never go back to. So that's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I, I, I liked the first Destiny when I played a little bit of it, and uh, I just like I feel like I could get into these games, but I just don't want to invest the time. I don't think, but it would be fun with with a, a few friends, though. I think for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> okay, well, I gotta get um, you know my typical couple mobile game recommendations for you. So there's a game that just came out this week called Not Words, K-N-O-T Words. And this is made by Zach Gage, um, who's done, he's done a bunch of other mobile stuff that I really like. They're kind of bordering on, I mean, they are casual games, but he always finds an interesting twist. And I find that they're really kind of well-designed UI-wise. He did Spell Tower, which is kind of like Tetris with words. And then... uh, really bad chess he did a few other things but this one is kind of like wordle meets sudoku so it's like you have a board that looks like a crossword puzzle and you have words that you have to fill out but within each section there might be like four boxes and it says okay the letters that can go in these four boxes are like a s l p and so you have to figure out which of those letters go in which box in order to make words and it seems like it would be really m-i-r-c i was trying to think of asl <laughs> uh yeah but does that mean anything to you asl yeah american sign language no <laughs> is that what people used to put on like m-i-r-c and stuff like that age sex oh like- yeah, <laughs> yeah <sorry. laughs> going way back um but yeah, I mean, like it, it. I think when the the boards get bigger, it does get more complicated. But then you just kind of concentrate on the longer stretches, like the bigger words, because those are harder to figure out. Um, and so there's daily words, and then there's some um, 
monthly groupings of puzzles they give you to work on as well. So I don't know, I, I was enjoying that. And just going to mention this, because I know we've talked about it in the past, but Netflix getting into the mobile game market, right? And they have like, last time I checked, they had like a couple Stranger Things games and a couple other weird casual things that I had no interest in. Checked the other day and suddenly they have Shatter Remastered. Do you guys remember Shatter? Like this the was, uh, alleyway clone or? Uh, yeah, it's kind of like a breakout type game. Oh, I love Shatter. Yeah, and uh, and so this is a new version of so that. So now I can play Shatter on the Shitter? <laughs> Shatter on the Shitter. That's exactly what this is meant for. Uh, it's kind of weird how... Have... Okay, how do these Netflix games work? Do I get them for free with Netflix? You do. The weird thing is you got to go into the Netflix app, and then if you scroll down a bit, they have like a section that says games and you click on it it will take you to the app store and you can download it from the app store but it's not like if you search in the app store i don't think it will be there so it's like a hidden link that you can only get to through the app and then the weird thing is i had to sign in with my netflix account on the game and it was failing at first and i was like what I think I got my password right and it just wasn't working and then the next day it just auto signed me in and worked so i don't know what was going on there but I was just uh, thinking about Shatter and that they need to make another one or bring it back because that game was awesome. Yeah. Kind of definitely. when you mentioned it, it reminded me of Velocity 2X, which I really loved also. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, so I, I guess the only other thing, I did play a little bit of Rogue Legacy 2. It sounds like you guys are probably going to play it in the near future, maybe. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll save. I'm debating streaming on that. So giving first impressions. I've always wanted to maybe stream roguelikes and see what it's like getting into the loop of a roguelike and capturing that. So look out for details on that. Could be coming soon. I'm not committing to a day or time yet. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. So we'll... Is that like, are we saving Rogue Legacy 2 or Sean, yay or nay? What's your take? Better or worse than the first? That seems to be the debate in the Discord. Well, uh, the weird thing for me is like I had Rogue Legacy on the Better Vita. Better or worse than the first? <laughs> I honestly don't remember much about the first. Like I, it seems about the same from what I remember. Uh, I just, you know, like in terms of, like I remember playing the first one and I think that was kind of when roguelikes were first kind of catching a wave of popularity. I don't think I really understood. The like, I might be wrong. I feel like Rogue Legacy was the first Rogue Light, or I one think of it the might first. have been. It was definitely the first one that jumped into the public consciousness yeah, of like, like there is popularity. And I, well, they, they, you they, get carryover. There's benefit. Like you get better no matter what. Even if you fail, you still get carryover leveling systems. Mm -hmm. The only other one I kind of remember around the same time was maybe Binding of Isaac. Like, I don't know if that came first or not, but... I don't, I don't think so. I think that came quite a bit later. Okay. But, I, I mean, when I, when I played the first one, like I said, I don't think I fully grasped that sort of the whole loop thing. I just kind of, I remember playing it a bunch of times and being like, okay, it's okay, and then putting it away and never playing it again. But, um, but yeah. Uh, completely unverifiable on Reddit. Someone is saying Spelunky might be the first roguelite, but it's Rogue Legacy that used roguelite first in its description. And mm -hmm. I've, I, from what I've played of Spelunky, it's a roguelike. At least Spelunky yeah. was. I don't remember. Yeah, I don't think you carry over anything if yeah, you I die. I think that's right, yeah. And it says here Binding of Isaac came out 2011. Shortly after. Someone here says, I think, yes, closely followed by Isaac. Okay. So, but yeah, so according to according to uh, Google Quick Search, Rogue Legacy 2013, Binding of Isaac 2011. So I'm not okay. sure. Okay. Rogue Legacy after. You mean I can't Binding trust this Legacy. Reddit thread for the actual information? Well, can, you, <laughs> can you trust Wikipedia? I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, the thing with Rogue Legacy, obviously, the idea of like having you know the heirs to choose from after you die i do find that that like uh, you know as much as 
the whole idea of these games is like the one more run. Like if you can get kind of a player addicted to having to do one more run, then it's, you know, you've done your job well. And I think Rogue Legacy may be the best at that just because as soon as you're presented with those options, you're immediately like, okay, I want to try out one of these guys. And you just jump right back in without even really thinking. So it's a pretty strong hook, I think. Yeah, I got deep into Rogue Legacy 1. I I got every trophy except for one, and it was the one where you have to beat it in like less than 15 runs or something like that. I think that was the only one I couldn't beat, and I was very close a couple of times, and then obviously now I would never be able to go back and get to my skill level of where I was at that time, but I, I'm excited to jump into Rogue Legacy 2. I've been missing missing a game like that. I haven't really... I, I tried to get into Dead Cells just, you know, a couple, like a month or two ago, and I I just couldn't do it, so I'm hoping Rogue Legacy 2 will scratch that itch. Yeah, I gotta go back to Dead Cells one of these days. I remember loving Rogue Legacy. It's what got me into Rogue Lights. Likes? Lights? Okay, anything else? We done here? I think we're done. Not quite a short episode. The, uh, the mechanics discussion had a little bit of a uh, a little bit of meat there, so I had fun with that. Next week, who knows? I don't think there's any big releases. Possibly a movie review? Possibly. Uncharted. Don't count on it. It's not 100% yet. Possibly. I, we It was our number one game of all time, Uncharted 2. We have to review the film. But uh, when that will be, we're not quite sure yet. Maybe some uh, some megatons will drop this week. To check us out on youtube.com forward slash game junk discord link is in there uh, on twitter film junk for sean mind Greek commute and equilibrium sis for andrew and thanks for listening bye-bye